Kira Kant and I'm a coach uh, and I work with women to help them to say their imposter syndrome, to build confidence um, and to help them have a different mindset around fear. So my book, which is Be Your Number One Julia, which has recently come out, super excited about, um, really is a tool to help you um, embody a growth mindset. Um, and today what we're looking at is talking about, you know, the negative thoughts that you have in your mind and working to, you know, silence them or really reduce them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Donna um, and ask you, Donna, you know, what do you do and why do you do it? So I'm, I'm a psychologist uh, and I recently trained also as a coach. So I'm working as an emotional eating coach, which means uh, basically I help women uh, to um, deal with emotional eating and the way sometimes we, we deal with emotion by using food as a crutch uh, to support us. And uh, um, I also help them overcome any body image issue they might have. It is part of my story because I've struggled for so many years with uh, emotional eating. I used food just to numb all my insecurities, my uh, the painful feelings, the situation, the challenges that we have all in life. And then I, um, I decided that I wanted to make this my mission to help other women just facing the same kind of insecurities and, and struggles uh, and support them in, the, you know, in, in their journey to heal their relationship with food. Amazing. And do you have a particular, um, you know, time or memory that you really struggled with food that you can share with us? Well, definitely there was a, a big, um, big moment when uh, when I found out that my mother was um, was sick with cancer and uh, oh she gosh. eventually, yeah. yeah, she eventually died. That was a very triggering moment for me because I couldn't just uh, cope with whatever was happening and I couldn't cope with the fact that there was nothing I could do. Um, and so there was a, a very, very dark moment where I, I uh, resorted to food, you know, to, to, mm. to support it. At the same time, I think it was a turning point for me because after my mother passed away, it was the moment that I had to really reflect on what, what I was doing, why I was using food that way, why I wasn't uh, I was stuck maybe in a job that I didn't like because I was insecure and I, I didn't think that I could do anything else. So for me, it was maybe the lowest point, but at the same time, also, I think many, many of us maybe find themselves in, in similar situations where your lowest point is also your turning point. That's when I really decided that there was something that I had to do. I asked for help because I was struggling with binges. Um, and then I... I make it my own path, like my own career path to, to help other women uh, struggling with the same. Mm, well, that's really courageous. And thank you so much for sharing that, Donatella. I'm sure that's really, you know, helped um, people to kind of get more of an understanding of like, you know, the start of your journey with food um, and how it's changed over time um, and why you're so passionate um, about being an emotional eating coach. So I'd just like to, next like to ask you, what does it mean to actually be an, an emotional eater? Well, uh, as I was saying, it, it is using using your using food um, as a crutch, as, as something that can support you whenever you feel like uh, uh, what you're feeling or the situation you're in is too painful to 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 even uh, bear with it. You you just uh, go and and eat food, and you get that uh, temporary kind of comfort from you know the bar of chocolate the cake i'm just mentioning the food that i really liked to be injured when i when i was into the, that trap um, and so it is um, being an emotional eater means that means uh, that it's hard for you to stop eating before you your body feels very uncomfortable so you end up sometimes feeling sick or really bloated after you know resorting to food. It means uh, uh, sometimes to eat in secret uh, because you don't want people to, huh, to, to know uh, how messy is, it is your, your relationship with food and how messy you can be with, uh, with any kind of food. It means guilt, shame, because um, deep inside you don't want to eat, but uh, there's something bigger than you that is pushing you to the fridge, uh, something that it's very hard to stop. 
So yeah, that's that's a big part of what, what uh, an emotional leader is, and that is also something that now that I'm working with it, I noticed that um, behind an emotional leader, sometimes there is uh, dieting, years of diets and trying to control food, trying to follow food rules. This is good, this is bad. I'm good if I eat a certain way, I'm bad if I eat uh, um, uh, the opposite way. So there is a lot of uh, inner critique, a lot of that gremlin inside your mind going on and telling you that uh, you're a bad person because you have no control over food, because you eat too much, because you eat all the bad stuff uh, that the diets have told you it's not good. So yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of things um, behind an emotional eater. Mm, okay, that's great. Um, and can you tell us like, you know, what challenges that you overcame? And um, when you started to, you know, turn the corner with changing your eating habits, because, you know, it's one thing to kind of like know that you need to change, but, you know, how did you start to employ change? And like, do you have any tips for people out there who might need um, some support with that? Well, I guess the, the, the biggest challenge uh, that you encounter is that uh, you had this crutch, you have this help from the food. So now you are like, uh, here is food, here is emotion. You were used to, you know, just link them and, and make everything look easier. And when you start uh, working on your emotional eating, you are just sitting there with your emotions and you don't have food anymore. You're trying to, you know, remove food and not go for that. So it is um, the challenging part is to just sit with your feelings and not go for mm. food. Learn how to sit with your feelings and, and maybe um, try to identify what else can you do uh, what, what helpful distraction can you use to, um, to cope with the feelings instead of going to food? Um, one thing that really helped me um, and which I was supported by a professional to do was to um, start journaling, start, start keeping a diary to understand uh, um, what what was behind my binges and what was behind the moments that I was emotionally eating. So I would note down uh, where was I, uh, who, I who was why, uh, I with, was in, if I was in the company of somebody and that I noticed that again and again would push me to, to grab uh, food. Um, what kind of situations would it be work, a presentation in work or would be maybe socializing uh, in a, so, you know, social context, going out and uh, meeting new people. So noting, start noticing, putting, putting down things that, that then I could go back and read. Then I could really understand what were my triggers. And that was the first step then to understand, okay, this is happening. There is the gremlin inside me telling me, go for food. I know what is happening. And then uh, little by little, I started to introduce something else, other activities or uh, for me, big one was uh, starting a mindfulness practice so that it could help me just sit with the feelings. I didn't even have to do anything in particular, like, uh, uh, I don't know, exercise uh, instead of eating. It was just sometimes sitting and just noticing what was happening and sitting with that. Mm, mm, fantastic. Mm. Not fantastic. easy. That's not, not easy. easy. That's not <laughs> easy. Because I can imagine you might have feeling from, you know, frustration and anger towards yourself, but also, you know, sadness um, because you feel unhappy about the state that you're in. But, you know, putting down the food and actually just being able to um, sit in that space is, is something that I think is, is really, really quite challenging. And it's good that journaling is but perhaps um, a way that you could you know, channel your thoughts, um, you know, meditation, um, and maybe exercise as well. And as you said, you know, speaking to a professional um, to help you to make sure that you're able to, you know, process those feelings um, and do something um, to, to help you move forward rather than to be in a, in a, a state of, um, you know, bl blockage. Um, so I just want to ask you about, you know, if you do feel a bit negative about your body, like what's one thing that you can do to kind of build your own body confidence? What would you suggest? Well, for me, it's, it's like a, there is a lot of inner work to do. So like starting to, even starting to um, 
to ask about yourself. How can I describe myself without uh, even mentioning, uh, without even, um, you know, um, linking myself to my body? What, what are my qualities? What are my skills? What are the things that I can do? If I was to introduce myself to someone uh, that doesn't know me, how can I introduce myself? What can I do? What do I do that doesn't really relate to my body? Because the, the, with the work that I do, um, the, a lot of the inner critics stems from the physical body, stems from weight, size. Um, so in order to, to really uh, understand our value and not just attach our value to the number on the scale, to uh, the way we eat, to the size that we have, we need to really focus on anything that is not body related, but that we can be grateful for and that we are good at. Because it's very easy for somebody that doesn't like the, their body, that is negative about their body, that is constantly, there's a name for it, it's called body, bash, body bashing, which is what you constantly give out at your body or what you don't like about it and how you are a, a loser or somebody that is not capable or anything because of your body. So uh, starting focusing to whatever your skills are, even gather feedback from the people that know you, that love you, and that certainly see past your body to understand uh, you know, what, are your, what are your qualities. Then there are uh, a number of even actions that you can take uh, on a daily basis. Like for example, if you don't have like a medical condition that where your, your GP, uh, your consultant is telling you that you should uh, get on the scale, I would recommend not even getting on the scale if that, that is triggering, you know, negative talk. Um, another way, something else you can do, you can just uh, maybe go check your wardrobe and see whatever it is that doesn't fit anymore or that you don't like anymore and, and start um, maybe getting rid of it or go, giving it to charity. But just see if you can bring some joy back to into your wardrobe, keeping the um, you know the clothes that really uh, make you happy, and not the ones where you look at them and you see and you tell them yourself that you, they don't fit you anymore. Plenty of other things, uh, keeping a gratitude practice towards your body. You might have been going. Your body maybe has gone through a lot. Like it could be pregnancies, it could be injuries, it could be any kind of illness. Uh, uh, could be through stress, depression. So understand how your body has been there for you all the time, even, even in under these very stressful conditions um, and develop gratitude for the body. This can all be helpful, I think, to, to, to challenge the inner critic when it's about your body. Mm, mm. And one thing you said to me um, the last time we spoke was about um, remembering what your body has already achieved. Do you want to um, tell everyone a bit more about what they can think about in that space? When I, when I did the exercise for myself, for example, I've seen that uh, despite uh, moments of uh, depression that I, that I went through, I, my body was still breathing. My body was still giving me the strength maybe to, to face whatever I wanted to face. I've, I've gone through uh, a major injury, for example, and then my body was still there for me. Maybe I wasn't able to walk for a while, but still, um, uh, as soon as, as I was able to, you know, uh, push myself, uh, I took the first steps, I, I went back to walk. So all those little things, the fact that, for example, my body is able to uh, bring me for a walk, bring me for a dance, um, even uh, even breathing when when it seems like something is is completely unbearable, there are so many things that you can identify, and, and uh, it is uh, kind of it is impossible for me to tell whatever it is that applies to Lucy or Chloe uh, or everyone in the room because it can be completely different, really. Um, all, um, each of us has, has had, I think, many things that they should they could be thankful. Uh, to their body for and I'm sure you have your own your own list can you think about anything yourself Ekwa? yeah <laughs> yeah I, I'm grateful that my body has has, has let me do um, a marathon it um and the London marathon so that is something gorgeous that I'm grateful <laughs> yeah for my body a language too um so I just wanted to ch check in with everyone else does anyone have a question or would like to unmute themselves and, and ask Donatella um anything whilst we're just thinking about what we're grateful 
for our bodies um, doing. Have you ever done, for example, anything like this? Have you gone through a list of uh, things right. you should be grateful for to your body for? No, I haven't actually done that, but I think that's a good idea. I go, I go for a general list of things that I'm grateful for generally in my life, but not particularly to my body. But if you think about it, your body does do a lot for you. So it's probably something that we should think about more often, more consciously. Um, so yeah, okay. Well, I will look out for any more questions, but if we don't have any at the moment, um, we will carry on. Um, so let's talk about um, the inner critic and you know, what does that, that mean to you in terms of you know, the work that you do um, and generally? Well, generally, like when I, when I look at inner critic through the lens of, uh, of psychology, for me, it, is, it, it makes total sense. So it is a mechanism that, <laughs> that we use to uh, protect ourselves, to defend ourselves. It is, I like to, from all the, the different definitions and uh, um, explanation of the inner critic that I've uh, read before, the one that really stuck to me was the evolutionary reason. So it is tracing back to when, um, when the, the old part of our brain developed and we were, um, the, our survival was depending on being living in a park, in a tribe. We, want, we wanted to, to really live in a tribe and be part of a group because that would, um, would mean that we could be protected and there was, uh, we were likely to survive. At the same time, if the group was seeing you as being weak, then they could have rejected you. We could have, they could have expelled you from the tribe because you wouldn't be able to contribute. So for me, um, not for me, but from a psychological point of view, the inner critic uh, that we develop was to make sure that we would could constantly assess ourselves if we were, so that we couldn't be seen as weak or uh, unhelpful inside the tribe, and we could still be part of a group, still be part of a tribe. Now nowadays. Maybe this is less relevant because uh, we have other ways to, to kind of uh, survive. We are, it's not a flight, fight or flight uh, uh, mode anymore, but uh, still we have kept this, uh, um, this habit, this tendency to constantly judge and question ourselves just to make sure that uh, we can still survive. So that is, that is the, 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 the most interesting and um, idea behind the inner critic that I that I that I really like that, that I found. Then again, when it comes to my more relevant for, for the work that I do, as I said, the inner critic uh, stems from body image. The fact that uh, um, we were all raised more or less uh, to different degrees, but we were more we were raised in a diet culture. So uh, when I speak about diet culture, I mean that. Uh, um, a culture where we think that uh, uh, thin, being thin, being skinny is like uh, equals happiness, equals being successful, having more, um, having the, the ability to perform better in, in, in work. So that negative self-talk and the, the inner critic uh, uh, can develop if you're not thin or if you are not, you don't conform to the certain standards that we are, uh, constantly bombarded with, you know, the perfect body, the perfect size, the perfect shape. Um, so the inner critic is basically, uh, it is possible to kind of tame that inner critic inside by the, moving uh, our self-worth, our value from the, the aesthetic part, the appearance, the looks to, as I was saying before, what is it that we are actually good at? Uh, what proof do we have that we are capable in work, that we are able to keep a uh, uh, healthy relationship? Uh, so anything that um, detaching really our value from the way our body looks, because uh, definitely um, happiness, certainty, confidence is not only for the thin people. And this is something that uh, I really had to face. Yeah. When I, when, especially when I started my, my business, because I told myself, okay, you're gonna work with women that are struggling with weight, that are struggling with, uh, you know, emotional eating, you, you're still, but you are not thin. You are not uh, somebody mm -hmm. that, uh, 
it was like um, something that I really had to face. Um, there were there were fears. Um, uh, my inner critic would say, "You are not able to communicate. You are you have a, a weird accent. People are not going to understand what you're trying to say." So even uh, do something like this, uh, coming yeah. into a room, speaking to total strangers, completely out of my comfort zone. So my gremlin would start saying here, um, you know, Donna, nobody's going to understand you. Um, nobody's going to get your point and uh, your business is not going to be successful. Uh, all these things that probably they're in the mind of an entrepreneur, I'd say. Yes, definitely. It might not be the same as mine, <laughs> but but a lot of self. And you know, you know what helped me was to uh, talk to other uh, business owners, uh, other women in business, and understand that uh, uh, we all have fears. We all have self doubt a lot more than we we even think. It's just that we don't like to voice that out, but we, we all have. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. I have definitely had fears and doubts and worries about starting my own um, business but you know I have decided to, to face them um, and I have thoughts like you did around you know can you really hear what I'm saying I like to be quite quickly um, and on all of those things and I've just been putting myself out there and practicing and trying to walk my own walk um, so what like particular advice would you give about trying to like really tackle those um, voices either around you know emotional eating or about putting yourself there, out there as a business person Collect evidence that that's not true. So when you when you realize that the, the, the I like to I still talk about the gremlin because for me it's a very vivid image. You know, when you realize that that the inner critic is kicking in and uh, you can acknowledge that it's there, you can tell your gremlin, yeah, okay, it's there. You're telling me that I can't do this or that I look ridiculous, but I don't trust that. And so you start collecting evidence that that's not true and the way the only way I think you can start collecting evidence is by taking action so even if I um, I shake at the idea of speaking in front of people uh, I still do that and then I try to collect the evidence that people understand me and they want to talk to me they want to share they want to communicate so it is about collecting evidence um, and, and celebrate any time you, you manage to do something, even if the little voice in your mind doesn't want you to do that. Uh, gather feedback from people that have been in the same, struggling with the same before. They have more expertise, especially in business. It's amazing when you connect to people that have more experience with you and they tell you, oh yeah, 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 I've been there before. I know how it feels. Um, yeah. Amazing. So take action. I know it sounds scary, but take action in any areas. For me, it was speaking, communicating, um, and also, also, you know, having the the inner critic telling me I don't have enough knowledge to work with women. I don't have what it takes at the moment. I might as well wait and do a little bit more study courses. I, yeah. That's all, all that was going on in my mind and still, still goes on in my mind, but I'm much more able to catch myself when I'm doing that. Yeah, and I think it's the acknowledging and catching yourself uh, and then, you know, disputing it and finding a way that to dispute it that works for you, whether that's actually saying out loud to yourself, that's, that's not actually true, or whether it's journaling and writing it down, perhaps, or whether it's having, you know, a voice note to remind you of the things that you, you know that you're working towards, or just practicing, because I always say that no one is, is, you know, born perfectly knowing everything and able to do everything, um, and so these things that we're saying to ourselves, um, which we don't think, believe that we're great at, we can always actually work to, um, you know, build our confidence um, and to take steps to really work to make it not be the case. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, um, because you had a uh, little look into the, the book, um, it'd be great if you could um, share some insights um, and what did you find in terms of helping your inner critic? Was there anything um, in the book that you think would help um, anyone on the call today? Like for me, like there are many, many points in your book that I can really totally resonate with me. Um, and But the one that uh, um, I... It's, it's just, it stood up to me was the uh, growing your your network. So um, 
developing a diverse network really don't try uh, maybe to just uh, surround yourself with people that are at the starting point like you like like me in, in, in my case but even if i'm scared about asking to people that have years of, of experience and a lot much more expertise than you uh, feel the fear but but just contact them anyway and connect with those people because they're the ones that they're going to give you support that they're going to give you maybe feedback that you can use so that the networking part is what really um, stands out to me also because i um i don't know maybe some of you can relate to this but uh, uh networking for me was like when i when i started uh, and i said okay i have to network it was just like a a task to me and because I'm introvert and I for me it takes a lot of uh, energy sometimes to connect always with different people and talk I, I always thought uh, I always cringe at the idea of networking I was like okay I have to pitch I have to show uh, myself to people in a way that they like me I have to tell them in uh, 20 seconds what I do and convince them that what I do <laughs> is good <laughs> So for me, networking in the beginning was only that. Yeah. And then I discovered the, the bright side of networking, the good side. So the side where you actually, okay, initially you are in a room, you don't know anyone, you have to pitch, but there are other ways of networking as well, like me and you, for example, like we met, we had a chat, we got to know ourselves, and then we share ideas. Uh, we connect one to one. Maybe we can see that we can do a collaboration. We can share a project. You can uh, use my skills, and I can use your skills to share a message to our groups. So that's the good side of networking. It's not just going there and say, oh, "Okay, I'm Donna. I'm a coach. I do this. I offer this. I offer that." There is much more to networking than that. I think you just have to find those the arena where, where that happens. Yeah, definitely. I think that networking has um, one of those uh, kind of catch all kind of like um, images of it just being about pitching and it not Very being about, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about, you know, building like real relationships because, you know, there's the old saying that, you know, people buy from people. They want to know about you. Yes, they want to know about your product or your service, but actually in the end, they want to know what makes Donna tick, what is Donna's story, you know, what, what, where has Donna been and what, challenges has done over, over um, come what challenges has Akira overcome or you know Chloe or Lucy or anyone else on the call you know because that really is like the essence of any um you know business like it's not just purely about the product it's always about mm -hmm. you know um how how you're connecting with your product with who you are as a person and, and how you're representing yourself and your product because you're not going to represent your product like the same way as anyone else so it's just about having that confidence to know that your story isn't something that you should hide it's something that you should you know want to become more comfortable with and be able to, to share that so that you can you know um, meet like my, my people and you know support each other and you know find out how you can you know, collaborate um or just you know have someone to recommend because i think it's always great to have people that you know who are not in your field to recommend yeah. um and have that kind of like diversity of people that you know because people will ask you different questions and you might not have the product or service to provide that but if you have a large network you can always recommend people that you, you know and trust yeah i think today to date i think for me uh, then your experience might be different, but to me, networking is the number one thing on the top of the list that are making me grow. It's there. There's nothing else I can be super good at, you know, sharing content on social media uh, uh, or I don't know, super good at what I do. But uh, there's always something that I can learn from somebody that maybe, as you said, it can be even into another field, but can tell, teach me a bit about communication. Uh, can teach me a bit about confidence, how to be confident, more confident, or because we are uh, in business, we know that how difficult it is to sell and to do a sale, uh, to, to close a sale with someone. So even learning all that, uh, most of the time for me, it doesn't happen through a course. Although I do courses, you know, whatever is it that, uh, that I can learn, but the most is, is you know, that comment, uh, or that talk that maybe I hear, I hear on a networking uh, event, somebody talking, 
and then I get to catch something and I say, oh, yeah, that, that's how it works. Yeah, I think that you're right, because someone talking and sharing their experience of, you know, how they learned how to use a social media tool or how they learned to do a particular thing in business is really helpful as opposed to just going on a course, because you hear, you know, um, from their perspective and you also hear, you know, how, um, what could work for you um, in terms of like the things that you can look out for when you're trying to um, use or implement that, that particular thing. Um, and, you know, just you know going on a, a tutorial um doesn't always do it so it's definitely worth asking totally. people totally and also voicing uh, your fears like uh, when you when you join a group and you trust the group where you're in just uh, letting people know that you maybe have something coming up you have your workshop coming up or you have a call with someone that you are probably trying to get uh, to buy from you but you're you're shooting yourself if I can say like <laughs> yeah. shooting your pants because you don't know how to do it if you if you tell to someone it's already for me a great relief yeah I know you yeah. love food so, no, so no, it's true. True. it's true yeah. it's true it's uh, true so yeah so what was it as we're on this topic you know, what, what keeps you going when you have a tough day you know how do you keep yourself going because you know it's hard to put yourself out there in business and some days you're like no I want to hide sometimes I just want to hide and not be on film <laughs> I guess it is like, uh, you know, the, the, those people that maybe contact me and tell me, okay, what you just said, it's me and you're really helping me. So if I stop showing up, if I stop uh, sharing, probably I missed a chance, you know, to connect to those people, help them. Um, and then, as I was saying, uh, at the very beginning, even the knowledge that I, I don't have an infinite time on this planet. So if I want to make, uh, if I want to make something good and ha help somebody uh, really make something uh, of this life that I have, I need to show up and I, I need to pursue, you know, whatever it is my idea and I need to connect more. So that's, um, that's I think that's a great motivation to, to keep you going. Um, one thing also that helps uh, me from stop hiding is not to compare myself too much. So in the beginning, I was into that uh, uh, that that loop of you know uh, always just checking whatever my competitors were doing or people with more experience were doing and just beating myself up. Now I put the, I put more the blinkers and I just uh, try to work at whatever I'm, I'm working without spending too much time. Of course, we have to do um, also competitor research because that's part you know, of the way we do research. But at the same time, I try not to fix too much, uh, fixate too much on, on, on how the others around me are doing better <laughs> or differently. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's, and one of the things about the, the growth mindset is about learning from other people who are more successful you. Successful thing. It's not about being fixated on their success. It's more about thinking about are there things that you could do in your own way that might help you to reach your audience and reach people that you want to work with. Um, so I think it's yeah. useful from that point of view, not in the just, just like, oh, okay, I'm fixated because like I want, I'm competing with them. It's more like I'm looking at them because I actually they're doing something that clearly seems to be working. Um, they seem to be growing and maybe if I look at that I can see if there's something that I like and if it's something I want to try um, and if I can you know find a way that works and it's authentic for me because I think that um, a lot of people think that just doing like a particular process or format is going to, it's going to automatically work and I think it's actually applying it and, and thinking about what is it that makes up that process and how is it that you can uniquely um, do that process um, rather than just being fixated on doing it like word to word, line for line, because even if you did that, you know, you are a different person to the person who created that process in the first place. <laughs> I agree with that. Oh, totally. Like you, you can certainly research and learn from what other people are doing, but then, you know, I, there is thousands, there is thousands of people uh, out there doing the same thing that I do, working on the same issues that I do. But yeah, you, when you find your own way, voice to do that, then it's it's more fulfilling, I, I think, because you you feel like you're really creating something of your own. Definitely, definitely. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to ask you if you have any final thoughts before we go into concluding um, questions. Who? <laughs> 
there could be a thousand of things we can talk about, but uh, probably uh, just uh, um, to, 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 to keep connecting and keep him voicing out to whatever doubts uh, uh, we have, I think it's a good, uh, good way to keep going, a good way to, um, to keep afloat, you know, in the, in the business journey. It is very hard. Like I, I face um, setbacks every single day. Um, I question myself and what I'm doing every single day, but still, still, I think uh, whatever um, wasn't working for me in my nine to five job, uh, whatever I was missing, um, missing out when I wasn't, you know, pursuing what I like. So many times I think we, we, we face setbacks. It's, it's about, you know, remembering as well, how did we feel before starting this journey? And I, I always like probably 99% of the time I can see the reason why I want to keep going rather to find a reason for going back to the previous part. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. I mean, nothing that we choose to do um, is going to be easy, but if we are passionate about it um, and we are open to opportunities and learning and to, you know, speaking to other people and finding out from their experience, then we can definitely help ourselves to move forward um, and to make the, the gains that we're seeking. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, Donatella, to tell us, let us know, like, what's coming up for you, how people can connect with you um, and, you know, you know, what specifically um, can they work with you on? Um, the best way to connect with me is to follow me on socials. And uh, because I, I, my understanding is that we have our business owners in the group and uh, entrepreneurs also. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, available on LinkedIn with my name and surname. I know it's very difficult to remember and to spell. So <laughs> I, I, but you can find me just typing that name and surname that you see there on the screen. Um, and then follow, follow my socials. I have uh, Instagram and Facebook account. Uh, I have a workshop coming up on the 21st of November, which is called Balancing Emotional Eating, where I take people through uh, self-inquiry and a series of practices to understand uh, um, if they are emotional eaters and what are the triggers and what they, the first steps they can, that they can take to, to overcome, uh, to start the journey and overcome emotional eating. So that's coming, uh, coming up on the 21st of November and it's gonna be online, obviously, for the time being, uh, most of the activities are online. Brilliant, brilliant. And tell us, whereabouts in the world are you, Donna? Don't tell her. <laughs> I live close to Dublin, so, so I'm in Ireland. And I've been living here for the past 10 years. So it's been, it's been a while that, uh, that Ireland adopted me. Um, but yeah, I'm originally from, from Italy because I think my, my accent anyway gives, gives away that I'm not Irish anyway. So. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Um, does anyone have any final questions just before we uh, wrap it up? Um, any burning questions about what you've heard so far? Any questions about emotional eating? Any questions about how to take action on your inner critic? Or, um, you know, anyone want to ask Donna a burning question? Um, oh, yeah. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Someone was saying it's really interesting. That's very good. Um, yeah, so I guess, Donna, I'm just going to ask you one last question now, my curiosity. Um, so with your background, um, being a psychologist, your work is, is mainly focused on the mind and not um, on the sort of like actual like sort of um, diet um, and like exercise part of it. Is that the case or? Say it again, I didn't get your question. So I'm you're, really honest here. That's okay. <laughs> so your, your, your practice is more focused on, on the mindset and not on the yes. like, yes, yes. So you're more about, you know, the emotions and, and the inner work and the different yeah. stories that people might have heard them, that have caused them to end it. So, yeah, I got your question now. So the work that I do doesn't focus on, on nutrition. So uh, when somebody comes to me, I'm not gonna ask how much they weigh or I'm not taking measurements of any sort. Uh, so we work on the mindset, we work on uh, how, um, can the person that I'm working with connect back to their body 
especially after years of dieting, you, you kind of end up losing connection with your body. You're not able to um, read the message from your body, hunger, fullness, uh, um, and, uh, and even um, the triggers of emotional eating if they're there. So we go and we do a deep work into uh, of self-discovery because definitely the work is done by the client, it's not done by me. Uh, and we, we analyze, we look into, deeply into, into how they can reconnect with their body, how can they sit with their feelings. So we, I use elements of mindfulness and most part of my work is based on the principles of intuitive eating as well, which is all about reconnecting to the body and, and go back to be intuitive eaters as we were when we were a child, very, at a very young age, because we all are born as intuitive eaters. It's just that along the way, we lose a lot of knowledge about that. Mm. Uh, I hear that yeah, comment. Um, oops. I was just going to say, so it must be quite a, a, a painful journey. It's not going to be something easy. So people need to be prepared to... Um, be there is resistance yeah there is resistance so yeah one of the things that you encounter in the beginning is resistance to really even open up sometimes um these are not easy topics and easy issues to to really speak so what i strive to do is to create a very confidential very comfortable space for people to to voice out whatever is it uh, that is happening Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, um, Donna. It's been an amazing um, chat. Uh, I think 